Good morning. Praise the Lord. I hope everybody's doing well today. Uh, I want to share something that the Lord spoke to me about yesterday. And this is kind of a sequence of events that led to what was revealed to me. Uh, so Thursday morning, I got a text message from Mike. And he said, hey, these are the scriptures that we're going to focus on for House of Prayer. So he sends me Genesis 12, verse 3, Psalm 122, and Ephesians 1. So, all right, cool. I'll read the scriptures. Still, nothing's clicking. We have a house of prayer on Friday. It was a glorious time. The Lord manifested in an amaz amazing way. But still, it's not clicking. So yesterday, I'm listening to this pastor preach a sermon and he starts talking about God's will so I've, I've talked about before about the will of God but then I decided to look up the definition of will in a dictionary and these are the two definitions that I got the will is the thing that one desires or ordains so we kind of expect you know the will of God to be done like it says in the Lord's Prayer but also, a will is defined as a legal document containing instructions as to what should be done with one's money and property after one's death. So, that got me thinking. What if we look at the Bible as the will of God, you know? A collection of the instructions on what to do after one's death. So I'm going to give you a few scriptures that you can look at some instructions. For example, on prosperity, Deuteronomy 28, verse 11 says, And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity, in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your ground, within the land that, you, that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. By healing, behold, this is Jeremiah 33, verse 6. Behold, I will bring it to health and healing, and I will heal them and reveal to them abundance of prosperity and security. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. About wisdom, James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. About joy, Psalms 4, verse 7. You have put more joy in my heart than they have with their grain and wine abound. Isaiah 29, verse 19. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exalt in the Holy One of Israel. Regarding children, Psalms 127, verses 3 to 5. Behold, children are the heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. About direction, Proverbs Three, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Regarding hope, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Regarding salvation, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 79. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So he's talking about John the Baptist here. And then this is confirmed in Romans 10, Verses 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So with those scriptures in mind and the definition that I read about will, let's put this in the context of what I just said. So you can look at this as the will of God is a document containing the instructions as to what should be done with God's promises after one's death. So you might be thinking, whose death? Well, the death of Jesus. You know, by his blood, we are redeemed and we can become new sons of God through Christ. So to be partaker of these promises, we must be born again. By being born again, we have become heirs to all the promises of God. So by being heirs, we get, we get to think about our inheritance. So what does God say about our inheritance? Well, this is when everything clicked. Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoptions, adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as the plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. So, you know, if you, if you, if you are to look at that, and we see the Bible as the will of God, when we read it, we're the executors. So let's read the Bible as it is the will of God, you know, so that we can know, understand, and expect to receive everything that is ours in Christ Jesus. Yes.
<laughs> yeah. I'm fastly. <laughs>
I did it. Yeah. No, it's, it's God. I just believe. And then, then uh, uh, Tom's talking about it. Then, you know, the doubt. Well, what if it does happen? Well, what if it does? It, that, it's not going to. I know in my heart of hearts, and I, I feel in my spirit. So uh, the river, I spoke to the river level. It's supposed to go to, uh, I don't know how to predict. It's going to go to 24. Well, the record is 25.7, and that's when the levee broke in 08. So this, they're saying it's supposed to go to 24.9. wants to speak the word. Will you not revive us again so your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord reveals the devour for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now installed. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Mark and Toby, could you take the offering, please? Yes, please. Thank you. And Toby, could you say the blessing? <laughs>
Let's worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We haven't seen the Father of Lights yet. said oftentimes Friday night I thank the worship team especially for recovering for me last um, Sunday as I was up in uh, Vermont with my grandma who turned 100 years old praise God she remembered me <laughs> that could be good or bad depending on my uncle who's two years older than me who had much influence on me when I was younger negative influence that was <laughs> anyway it was a pleasant time I saw the video. God was moving here last week. Appreciate Roberto taking the reins and letting the Lord work through him. This is good. This is good. When I come to worship my God, my King and my Lord, thank you for what he has done. Hallelujah. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Suffer the little children to come unto me. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's worship him with the angels. All these saints and angels bow before the throne. All the elders cast crowns before the Lamb of God
Spirit is moving. This is a translation for what has just been spoken from the Lord. He'll use anyone in this room. Just speak it out. There's an interpretation. Speak it out. is a safe place. The Lord is teaching. He wants to release. Even if you're 
clear in the back of the room. It doesn't matter. There's an interpretation from what our sister just spoke. Don't be shy. This lifts up the Lord. This glorifies the Lord. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Jesus. And we know this is just the start, Lord. As the sun comes to the sky in the morning, it shoots out little bits of rays in church. We've just saw just one sliver of what's coming. With that, we worship him. We love him. We thank you, Jesus, because you've won it all. We celebrate what you have done, Lord, and what you are going to do. Thank you, Jesus.
Jerusalem was mentioned many times in this room this morning. Jerusalem was mentioned this, many times this morning in this room. In Psalms 122, it says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Hallelujah. for the peace of Jerusalem.
Scripture says that Jesus himself said he would not return until Israel cries out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's not, he's not waiting for us. He's waiting for them. Praise God. And I believe what Don and others were talking about here this morning is the evidence that that time is drawing near because we're seeing more and more. I just heard uh, a statistic uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, that from 1967 to today, more Jews have converted to Christianity or Messianic uh, Judaism than all of history up to that point. Now, can you imagine the thousands of years and in just whatever that is, 48 years or 47 years, whatever, more people have come, more, more Jews have turned to their Messiah, Yeshua. So there are some crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence this morning. Praise God. Hallelujah. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise Amen. The Lord. Give the Lord a big hand clap this morning. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Thank all of you for your uh, testimonies. and uh, Thank you for being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and not being afraid to speak out. I know sometimes that's kind of intimidating, but amen. With, without that, I mean, we need to hear an audible voice of the Lord. But that audible voice has got to come out of somebody's mouth, praise the Lord. So appreciate it when uh, people step out in faith and, and do that thing. Praise God. Amen. I want to... Uh, I want to start this morning, I'm going to read from John chapter 1 and then Romans chapter 1, but I'm not going to go there just yet. You can go ahead and put them up on the board if you want to, uh, Roberto. John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12 is where, we're, where I'm going to actually start the uh, text for the message, but I want to talk about something else just briefly here. And... Uh,
you all know the story of when uh, the prophet Nathan came to David and, and told him, he said, you know, there was, a, there was once a rich man had flocks and thousands of sheep and had everything going for him, but he said in, in that same town there was, a, there was a poor man who only had one lamb. And he went on to tell him about, this is in, uh, you don't have to go there, but you can go and check this out later. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 12, and it says that this poor man had nothing except this one little ewe lamb, which he had brought, he had bought it, and it says he had nourished it up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat, and drank from his own cup. This lamb was a part of their family. And he wasn't just a pet. You know, I've got some pets, but they don't eat at my table. And they don't drink out of my cup. And there are times when I'd like to get rid of them. But I can't bring myself to do that because I just spend too much time with them. But what this is telling us is that was communion. How many of you know every time you see the lamb, we're talking about Jesus. That lamb wasn't just some lamb. It had been integrated into this family. So that it says even that when the man went to bed at night, the lamb would lay on his bosom or lay on his chest. Now this is talking about a personal relationship with Jesus. Something that Israel, I'm afraid, missed. And something we're capable of missing too if we're not careful. Jesus wants to be a part of our life. Not just Sunday. Not just at church. But he wants to be an integral part of our, and I'm not now talking about religious behavior, I'm talking about a relationship to where we have communion with him. We have communion, but that becomes a ritual. We, have commun we can have communion with him constantly, continuously. That's what this is telling us. And if you go back, you can see what I'm, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is if you go back to Exodus chapter 12, you'll see what God was trying to do when they were getting ready to, to leave Egypt and before God allowed that death angel to come through and destroy all the firstborn of, of, of Egypt, and it would have been any firstborn of Israel too who did not apply the blood. But it's interesting that there, he also told them, for each house, you bring a lamb, and you keep that lamb in the house. You keep it up, it says, up in the house for four days. And on the fourth day, you shed its blood and put the blood of that lamb over the doorpost. He didn't say just some indiscriminate lamb, just some one that's running around out here in the flocks, but I want you to take one and make it a part of the family. More than just a pet, but you know, the kids are attached to it now. It's become something real to you. It's become a living, live thing. It's not just some animal to sacrifice, but it's actually become... You, you have a connection with it, in other words, so that when you slit his throat, it hurts. You feel a loss that you've actually had to give something for this. That's what Israel didn't understand, I think. They could kill the animals by the thousands. But God wanted intimacy with them. He wanted relationship with them. And when we get to where Jesus is just part of our religion, where he's no longer real and personal and something that we lost but gained from at the same time, then we're just practicing religion. He wants to be a part of our life every day, not just when we say, but he wants us to be in communion. communion is common unity. 
you know, just every day, all the time, in every situation, in all circumstances, he's a part of us. And again, I'm not talking religion. I'm not talking about being a perfect person. I'm talking about just that he's, he's involved in everything we do. If he never leaves us or forsakes us, if, he, if we walk with him, we talk with him, you know, like the old song says. I'm afraid Christianity is repeating the mistakes of Judaism to where Jesus isn't personal to me. He's not something close. He's not something that, that, that I've, that's become a part of me. I've got a vested interest in him. You know, I, I don't want to see uh, you know, him go away. I don't want to see him not be. You know what I'm saying? And that's what the Bible's trying to teach us. Through those sacrifices, it, it wasn't about just let's kill another. God said, I, I don't, sacrifices, I don't really want sacrifices. I want you. Yes. So if the sacrifice doesn't mean anything to you, you understand what I'm saying? I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm just saying we need to think in the context of, of how God feels about us. He wants us to feel something about this sacrifice that he made. Yes. Recognize how much it cost him. Yes. How precious that blood was. And how much he loves us in order to shed it. Yes. Amen? Amen? Okay, so now let's move on to the text. I mean, I, don't, I, I think sometimes it's so easy as Christians to forget that this really isn't what it's about. This is important that we come together and, and encourage one another and God can speak to us through tongues and interpretation, through the music that's played, through the praise and the, the testimonies. But it's about an everyday life that is connected so that when you go through your life you go through it with him. You don't just have him on Sunday or on Wednesday or on you know, certain times when you're going through a crisis. But he's, he's become a part of your family, a part of you, a part of who you are, a part of what you do. That's what he wants. He's not wanting religion. He's not wanting a bunch of rule keepers and do-gooders. All that's fine, but that's not what he's after. He's after intimacy with you. He's after be, being a part of what is important to you because it's important to him. Praise God. All right, John chapter 1, verse 11. He came into, unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, he's talking about the Jews, but then he transfers that over to anybody and everybody who believes. So he came to the Jews who had all this religion, and they had no connection with him. So little, in fact, that they didn't even know him. They didn't even recognize him, right? Then in Romans, let's go to Romans chapter 1 and verses 1 through 6. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scripture, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Now, one more. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31 and read verses 31 through 34. <clears throat> Behold, the days come. This is Jeremiah prophesying of this thing that Jesus was going to do, of what Paul was just talking about and John was talking about. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. 
I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. They were teaching what they didn't actually know. Right. Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So the sacrifices are all epitomized then, of course, in Jesus. The thing that they didn't get out of it, eventually they will get. And they'll realize that it was him. And it says they will be ashamed and they will weep for the, the one whom they had pierced. So 2,000 years ago, the Pharisees, along with uh, a lot of other religious uh, men and women, these were some of God's most zealous followers. I mean, these were religious zealots, if you will. I mean, they were fanatical about it. And they found themselves in a place that they never would have imagined. Despite their study of the scripture, despite their rigid obedience to everything that they found in it, they had become enemies of God. Worse yet, they were oblivious to what had happened. And I'm not questioning their intentions, as I do believe that they, they really did believe that their extra rules and their spiritual disciplines were the way to live for God. And they believed that their rules and their standards were biblical and the way to please God and a way to determine somebody's standing with God. Unfortunately for them, they had no idea that the people they were excluding were precisely the people that God was inviting. We had a man sitting on the front step out here this morning. I don't know if he's the guy that Mark and I talked to here a while back, but we invited Mar uh, you know, Mike invited him in and had to be part of the service, and he chose to go on and do something else, but that's beside the point. We've had people that lived under the bridge down here come and be part of the service. I've had them stand up and testify and cuss a blue streak while they're testifying. They, they were serious, praise the Lord. <laughs> but I don't want to be guilty of turning away the very people that God's trying to invite. And so sometimes it's awkward. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. But nevertheless, if they, if they come, they can come. You know, I mean, if they show up, we're going to invite them to be part of what God's doing here. Because we can fall into the same trap today, and we can sabotage the work of God when we get so focused on what we see as God's agenda. So focused on what we think God's plan is that we lose touch with the very heart of God. That's what happened with Israel. God was trying to show them his heart through these sacrifices, through the bring this lamb in and make it a part of your family and let it eat from your dish. Let it, I mean, you had the chair for mom, the chair for dad, the junior, the little girl, and the lamb. One cup. He, dad, mom, junior, sister. Bah. I mean, they made it a part of their family. So that's what God's trying to get us to understand is we can, we can forget in the, in the doing of stuff, in the, in the religious kind of rule keeping and, and, and trying to be, you know, all this stuff that we're really not to begin with. We can lose track and, and misunderstand the heart of God by trying to figure out his agenda. God will do what God does. All we got to do is what has been testified to here all morning, and that's just trust him. Yeah. Just trust him. Yeah. So you know how many of you, you, just like it was said, I was thinking while we were talking, how many times, you know, God has given a promise, and so then I go about trying to figure out how he's going to do this. Yeah. 
And I spent a lot of sleepless nights trying to figure, was that, you know, was this it? Was that it? And then, of course, about the time you think you got it figured out, as Brother Tim said, something altogether different happens. Or, uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, struggling over two months of being out of work. That's understandable for anybody. And all the time, I'll bet, brother, you were doing the same thing I've done. All of us have done. Well, how's he going to, is it this job? Is it that? Is it, how's he going to do this? And when it's all said and done, not only does he give you the job, he gives you one twice as good as the one you had. Yeah. Amen? I mean, that's the way he does it. But we have to learn to trust him. And you know, it's great that it causes us to seek after him, to, to want to make him more a part of our lives. But you know, when we really self-evaluate, which is really not a good idea, but we do it all somewhat anyhow, we know we really didn't do anything that great to make it happen. I mean, we weren't really that much better. <laughs> we might have tried to be a little nicer or whatever. But believe me, when we start making that the, yeah. you know, the, the mark that we're trying to achieve, we're going to be very disappointed and feel unworthy yeah. and not expect that God's going to do anything for us. Right. But see, God wants to be a common part of your life, not just the spectacular, not just the, you know, the unusual and the, 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 the super spiritual but just the common everyday goings on. He wants to be included in it. He wants to be the lamb at the table. He wants to be the lamb that goes to sleep with you at night. Can you imagine they smelled like the lamb? There is an aroma, the Bible says. Whenever there were sacrifices, there's like a sweet savor that comes up to God. And he says, we carry this. There's a place that Paul talked about, you know, to some, it's the smell of damnation and death. But to others, it's the smell of victory. The same Jesus, that same lamb, to some it smells like, this is great, this is like potpourri. And to others, it's like, that's a barnyard, man. Clean the house, you know. But it's just perspective. You know, when you've got pets, it's funny how you don't notice it so much. Boy, but have a visitor. <laughs> that's why I've got, what, five or six air filters in the house. Two upstairs, three downstairs, going all the time. Because I don't know what other people are smelling but I don't want them smelling what I think they could smell. <laughs> I like the animals, but I don't want to smell like the cat. Praise the Lord. But I don't mind smelling like the lamb. Praise the Lord. Romans seven nineteen. Paul says, my life is like a roller coaster. The harder, I, the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I do, I would not, I, that I do. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. We can all say amen, Paul. Praise, Praise God. But you see, the kingdom of God has to have room for disciples like Peter, who denied the Lord. He just chickened out. He just freaked out. And not only denied him, but was swearing, I'll be, but if I know the guy. You know, I mean, he panicked. That needs room for people like uh, Mark, you know, John Mark, who Paul had a lifelong gripe with because the guy chickened out. They were on a mission trip. It didn't happen quick enough. Some things were going on that he wasn't familiar with that he hadn't expected. And he panicked and went home. And Paul and Barnabas fell out about it because Barnabas wanted to bring him back the next time. Paul said, no way. He's already shown me he's a gutless coward. I don't want nothing to do with him. And Barnabas left him and took Mark. And There has to be room in the kingdom for people like Joseph of Arimathea 
another coward. Another guy uh, come to Jesus at night. He, didn't, he, he, he believed, but he didn't want anybody to know that he believed. He wouldn't publicly declare it for fear of what it might cost him. And obviously none of that is anything to be proud of. But here's the good news. None of that disqualified them. Jesus pursued each one of them. He put denying gutless Peter to work leading his church. He used the little coward John Mark to write his biography. And he chose the rich, frightened, secret disciple, Joseph, to provide a tomb and to bury him with. So Paul's dilemma here in Romans 7 was struggling with the old covenant mentality. And his cry was the same as I'm sure Peter's, Mark's, Joseph's, mine, yours. Who can deliver me from this flesh from this weakness this cowardice this wishy-washy up and down committed uncommitted sometimes on the fence don't know what and the answer comes in verse 25 of Romans 7 Jesus amen thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord so then with the mind I serve myself or serve the law see Paul had this it was a struggle with old covenant mentality. But with the flesh, the law of sin. So thank God, he will continue to pursue us. He will never leave us or forsake us. Amen. There is not something but someone. Praise God. So back to John chapter 1 and verse 16 and 17. Praise God. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So there is... As Jeremiah prophesied, a new covenant, a new creature, a new man. His mercies are new every morning. He gives us a new heart, a new spirit. We speak with new tongues. There's a new heaven, a new earth. There's a new song and a new Jerusalem. There's new wine and new wineskins. There's a new garment. There's a new name. And last but not least, Romans 21 says, Behold, I make all things new. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So you see, what I'm saying is we're not destined, amen, to the roller coaster ride that Paul is talking about. Amen. We are destined to victory, to always overcome, to always be victorious, no matter what it looks like at any given time. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. And I'm going to try to move right through this and get you out of here quickly. Praise the Lord. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. That lamb, right? But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Praise the Lord. So we have entered, amen, a new country of grace. He's talking about the promised land. We've moved, and that promise really was about grace that Jeremiah prophesied that they were sacrificing for but never did figure out. Amen. So we've entered this new country of grace. We have a new life in a new land. Praise the Lord. We live in grace land. Yeah. Hallelujah. Right. And Adam has left the building. Praise the Lord. 
It's no more Adam, it's Jesus. It's the Messiah. We're not connected to him anymore. We're connected to the, late, the last Adam, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Okay, verses 4 through 16. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that enters into his rest, is he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Praise God. So by faith, we enter this new life in this new land, right? And this new land called rest. Praise God. And it declares that everything I do from here on out has to flow from rest. Praise God. It's living in houses I didn't build. It's eating from vineyards that I didn't plant. It's benefits that I had nothing to do with except by faith. Praise the Lord. It's simply learning to live out of the finished work of Christ. The same thing that brought them uh, protection, Passover, is what we're supposed to be operating in today. No fear. No weapon formed against you can prosper. Right. That doesn't mean your weapon is greater. Right. You don't have a weapon. Right. Your weapon is rest. Because he's already defeated your enemies. Right. If the battle is the Lord's. But as Don mentioned this morning, if, if it's horses and chariots you're trusting in, buddy, you better have the biggest horses and the best chariots. Yeah. Praise God. See, the new land, this new country, it's not future. It's mine, and it's mine right now by faith. Right. Praise God. It's the same country that the people in Hebrews 11, the people of faith, were looking for. They were still dealing with the prophecies of Jeremiah, with the types and the shadows, but they were looking for a land. Look, look at Hebrews 11, and let's read this all, 1 through 14, and put that into context with where we are today and what God is trying to get us to understand so we don't make the same mistakes. They didn't enter in. There were lots of things that they didn't get. That's why they didn't recognize the lamb when he showed up. You know, the scripture says that uh, if, you, if you have a colt, a, a, the colt, the foal of an ass, when it's born, you have to offer a sacrifice or else you have to break the neck of that colt. Read it in Leviticus. A lamb has to be slain for you to keep the donkey. That's why Jesus rode in to Jerusalem on the foal of an ass, on a colt, on a, on a donkey. The lamb 
was coming in on the donkey that had been spared. He was telling everybody, look, your brokenness, your, your, you don't have to be broken anymore. You don't have to be destroyed. You don't have to be desolate. I'm coming. Your lamb is coming in, amen, to take all that away from you. Because they didn't get it in the first place. Therefore, they didn't get it. The religious people didn't get it when the reality showed up. Because they really had no personal connection. He was this far off thing. And that's what I don't want to be my life about. I, I don't want that to be your experience. I, I want us to have a relationship with Jesus and let the rest of the crap filter down and be whatever it is. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to religion. I'm just saying it has its place, but come on, it's not first place. Because when you make it first place, then you lose the, the attraction of God. You lose the connection with God. You lose the security and the sense of dependence and, and confidence in God. So now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, and science has finally caught up with this, everything that's here comes from atoms which are invisible to the naked eye, but everything that's here is made up of atoms. So what's visible was invisible until it took on a visible form. Everything in the kingdom of God works that way. It's there, it's all out there, you just don't see it. That doesn't mean it's not real, it's as tangible and real as anything else. You just don't see it. You believe it, the way God faithed in those atoms into something that was now formed. Praise the Lord. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Why? Because he offered a blood sacrifice, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. Now, Abel wasn't any better than Cain. His sacrifice was better. God wasn't looking at Cain, and he wasn't looking at Abel. He was looking at the sacrifice. Abel brings the lamb. God said, that's acceptable. Cain brings, what, rutabagers and, you know, I don't know, garlic or something. And he said, no, it's got to be blood. So the result is, Abel is righteous, Cain is unrighteous. Not because of anything that they had done up to that point, really not for anything they'd done after, but because of the sacrifice that was provided. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. How did he please God? He believed God. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. He answers the question right there. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not, yet, not as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Noah wasn't any better than anybody else on the planet in terms of his behavior. He was just pure. He was human. Amen. There was Nephilim. There was all this mixture. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And when he went out, not knowing whether he went, didn't know where he was going, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as, a strange, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Yes. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. By faith, we 
we enter this new life, this new land, this new land called rest. And it declares that everything comes from rest. Amen? The location of this new heavenly country is in Christ. They were looking for it, but it, they never got it. Now, we, we look at that and it sounds contradictory. My God, they got blessed, they got this, they got delivered, they got that. But they never got the country. They never got Christ. They got the promise. They got the future forecast, but they never entered in. They never got the fulfillment of that. They were looking for a country. All of their lives they looked for that country. That country was Christ. Amen. They looked for it. We have it. Yes. We, we reside in it. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 2 and 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See the hath? That's past tense. It's already happened. Praise the Lord. So it's available to be enjoyed right now. Praise God. All right. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, the scripture says it's far above all principalities and powers, might and dominion. It's a new land and it's called Christ. It's above all the mess. It's above all the, 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 the other dominions and all the other powers and all the other... Uh, you know, uh, principalities. Yes. Amen. It's a new land. Yeah. Yeah. It's called Jesus. Yeah. It's called Grace Land. Hallelujah. Glory. Ephesians 1 and 3. This is the last scripture. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Praise God. So our hope isn't in what we do for God, the mistake of the Pharisees and the religious people. Our hope is in what God has already done for us. That's the gospel. That's what keep people like me like you, righteous. Righteous citizens of the kingdom, the new country in Christ. Praise the Lord. Everything is ours. Let's don't get so religious that we, we think we've got God's agenda figured out and we don't even have a clue. We've entered in. We, we're born again. We're new creatures in a new country. All power, all blessings, yes. they're ours. But you do not get them by, by self-effort. You get them by rest, simply trusting in that blood, in that precious lamb that was slain. Praise the Lord. This next time you sit down at the table, set an extra plate. <laughs> Amen. Just, just make him a part of everything that you do. You're not hiding anything from him anyway. You know, well, I can't do this because, you know, this isn't real spiritual. I'm not telling you what to do or what not to do. I'm just saying whatever you do, do it in the name of Jesus. Just do it with Jesus. Just do it with him included in it. Eat the fat. Drink the wine. That's what he said. Next barbecue, don't be freaking out. Just... Invite Jesus. Yeah. Don't be afraid to, 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 to thank him. Right. Amen for the whatever. Thank him. Yeah. He loves a party. Yeah. Praise the Lord. He just doesn't love stupidity. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's dangerous for us, right? <laughs> but he's a good God. Yeah. And he wants to be a part of your life, every yeah. part of your life. Yeah.
it's like uh, using the analogy I've been using with the lamb, but obviously I'm not trying to be blasphemous and God knows my heart, so even if you don't, uh, love me, love my dog. You know, love me, love my lamb. If, if, if that is a part of you, people just recognize that's part of who you are, that's part of what you are. Our, our testimonies, these testimonies are fantastic, but our, our living testimony is just that we're connected, that we trust Jesus. And that's what ultimately you see the result, right? The, the gal calls, and she now wants to borrow your lamb. Yeah. Let me take your pet home with me, you know. They, why? Because they see that you believe this, even if they don't believe it. But when push comes to shove, they've run out of options because the doctors don't have the answer for this particular thing or that. And now they say, well, you know that Jesus you tried to introduce me to? I'd like to meet him. You know, you don't, as was said, we don't have to force unless the spirit draws them. So we just make them available. Uh, yeah, we've said it before, too. A lot of times people that are not, you know, in Christian culture, yeah. it's like they're, you're speaking a foreign language to them. So a lot of the things that we take for granted because we've heard it so many times, we've shared with one another, and we talk about it, and we just start talking that way to somebody who isn't a believer, they're thinking, God, give me a translator here. I don't, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. You sound bizarre, you know? And so... It's better to just be you. You know, just be you, and Jesus is good. God loves you. He lo- you know, he's been good to me. And just talk their language. Only just inject the love of God in it, right? Amen? Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Okay, praise the Lord. God bless all of you. Again, I appreciate your testimonies and uh, sharing with us. Have a tremendous day. Enjoy this upcoming week. It's supposed to be cooler weather, so you get outside and swat mosquitoes. Hallelujah. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord.